Hello everyone. The topic of today's lecture are binary choice models. For this lecture you need to load the package mfx in R and you also need two files which you can download from Canvas. Those files are organic.csv and gss.csv. Binary choice models are used when you have to model a dependent variable which is coded 0 or 1, or which can be answered with, a, with or which can be answered with a yes or no answer. So for example, if you are interested in whether people voted uh, over the last during the last election, and you are interested in which characteristics make it such that a person votes, then you would use a binary choice model. The binary choice model models can answer questions like did you vote during the last year? Did a person commit a crime after being released from prison? Did a person participate in a labor market? Did you purchase a home? All those questions can be answered with yes or no, a binary choice. Now, binary choice models are very different from dummy variables. During the last lecture, when we talked about multivariate regression, we looked at dummy variables that were also coded 0 or 1, but those were independent variables. When we are talking about binary choice, we are talking about dependent variables being coded 0 or 1. We will see that we are going to calculate the probability that a particular individual uh, answered a question or had the outcome answered with yes or a 1. Now note that in the more advanced class of regression analysis, i.e. SPIA B507, you are also going to expand on those models when you're looking at categorical dependent variables or uh, variables that have no particular order in it. So for example, if you're interested in how people community, com commuted to campus, whether they biked, walked, took the car, took the bus, etc. Okay. So, but for this lecture and for this class, we are only going to look at binary choice models. Now, before we get into the topic, I would like to talk about what are called numerical methods. So, consider the very simple equation where we have y is equal to x squared. So, you know that if x is equal to 8, you know that y is going to be equal to 64. If I said that y is equal to 81, and I asked you what x is, then you would tell me that x is equal to 9. How did you calculate this? Well, you reversed this equation and made y a function of x which is simply the square root of y. Now consider the following equation. y is equal to x squared plus the square root of x. So for example, if x is equal to 9, then we know that 9 squared is 81 plus the square root of 9, which is 3, and we know it is 84. Now, what about if I asked you, well, y is equal to, say, 105? And I ask you, well, what is x? Now, it turns out that there's absolutely no way to solve this particular equation as x as some function of y. So you cannot, you cannot do this for an equation that looks like this. What you have to do is, if I really ask you this question and you had to find it out what x is, you would simply have to try and error. You have to uh, try and error until you find the correct value of y. Now note that this trial and error is also what mathematical programs can do 
and they are called, and then those methods are called numerical methods. It turns out that for some of the variables that we are going, for some of the models that we are going to look at, like the logit and the probit model, that computers are going to use numerical methods because there is no closed form solution. Now you will see that in most cases this is going to be very fast and you're not going to see any delay in results. But if you have very large and very complicated models, it may take a while for those models to solve. But I don't think that this will be an issue in this class. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, we are going to model the outcome. For example, a person voted, which we code 1. And if the person didn't vote, we are going to code that as 0. We are going to calculate this in terms of a probability. Okay. Now, if you think about how a dependent variable that is coded 0 or 1, how this is going to look like, then what you will find is that if you have y on the vertical axis and x as on the horizontal axis, and you know that y is coded as 0 or 1, then you're going to have a bunch of observations down here, where you have the 0, and you're going to have a bunch of observations up here. Okay? But you're not going to have any observations right here. Now, theoretically, you could run a regression model between those between those uh, between those two sets of observations, but it would not be very sensible. So what we do instead is we are thinking about a function, and we are going to call this function g that is bounded between zero and one. Now, this makes sense because we mentioned before that we are going to model the outcome variable, whether a person voted. We are going to model this as a probability. And we know that from the previous lectures, we know that a probability is limited between 0 and 1. So it cannot be below 0 and it cannot be above 1. We have to find a function that is also limited between 0 and 1. Now consider, let me call this inside here x, and think about this x as being the same as here. So we want to find a function such that no matter what x we are putting in here, the function is going to be bigger than 0 and smaller than 1. So if you uh, were to visualize this, we are looking at the function that if x is very small, it's going to be 0. But then if x gets bigger, the function is going to get log, get g is going to be bigger as well, but it's going to be limited at 1, even if x is very big. So what we are going to do is we are going to look at a function that is s-shaped, like this. So it's above 0 and below 1. Now, in the binary choice models, there are two functions that are going to be shaped like this. And those are the logistic function. And those are also the cumulative normal distribution. Now, to illustrate this, Note that we have here we have the logistic function, which is this S-shaped curve, and it is bounded between 0 and 1. Also, if you're thinking back about the normal distribution, and we have the cumulative distribution function, then again this function is S-shaped, and it is bounded between 0 and 1. Okay? 
because this is like the probability that is bounded between 0 and 1. Now note that the logit model and the probit model are extremely similar in terms of results. Usually there is not a difference of whether you are going to use the logit model or the probit model. The story I have heard about the logit model, why it was preferred for a very long time, is that computationally it was much easier than the probit model. Now, in today's, uh, in today, this is not a problem anymore, given the computing power of modern desktops. Okay? So, logit model and probit model are more or less identical. Note that they are identical in results, but they are not similar in coefficients, and I will talk about this later. Now, let us consider our first data set, and the data set we are going to use is called organic. Now, this is a data set where we only have two variables. We have income and we have buying. Buying indicates whether a, resp whether a respondent purchased organic food. Yes is coded as 1 and no is coded as 0. And note that the income of the respondent is $1,000. Now, what we are going to do is first we are going to calculate the coefficients. We are getting the coefficient estimates. And the coefficient estimates in the first step is going to tell you whether a particular independent variable is statistically significant or not. Now, the coefficients, the value of those coefficients, is not going to tell us much. And it is only the sign which we can interpret of how in which direction the probability goes. In order to say something about how does, say, an increase in income changes the probability of a person purchasing organic food, we need to calculate what are called the marginal effects. And then we, were also going to we are also going to calculate the predicted probabilities. Okay. Note that we have to make some additional steps in order to get the marginal effects and also the, probability, the predicted probability estimates. Okay. So in order to get the coefficient estimates, we have to use a command which is called GLM. GLM stands for Generalized Linear Model. Note that we also have to add an additional parameter where we specify that we are going to use a logit model. Okay. Now, we are also going to run a second model where we estimate the exact same coefficients, but we are going to use the package MFX. We are going to use the, pack the command logit MFX in order to get the coefficients. And I will demonstrate that there are only slight changes. Okay. Note that if you are interested in running a probit model, you have to replace logit with probit, and here you have to replace logit with probit again. Okay. Now let us switch to R. Note that I have the dataset organic, where we have the income in the first column, and we have buying in the second column. Note that we have data about 100 consumers. Let us first run a logit model. I have loaded the data already. So let us just say b hat glm logit. Note that I call this object a little bit uh, more detailed in terms of Am I using a logit or a probit model? And am I going to use the package MFX or the GLM command? So here I'm saying b hat GLM logit is equal to GLM. And then is buying tilde income. The data is organic. And then I have to be explicit that I'm talking about a logit model. Here I have to type in family, 
equals binomial parentheses open link equals logit. I execute the line and then if I want to get the estimates, let's say summary, we had GLM logit. And I get the estimates. Note that the coefficient estimates, in terms of statistical significance, are interpreted the same way as before, in the sense that we are looking at the number of stars, and everything that is below 10% is considered to be statistically significant. Now, in this model, we see that income is indeed statistically significant in explaining purchasing of organic food. Now, before I continue, you can actually plot the data. Let's say organic income, comma, organic buying. And you can see that the data indeed looks like what I demonstrated before. Here, I assume that people that have a lower income do not purchase organic, whereas people that do have a higher income do purchase organic. Okay. So note that now I can run this model with uh, the MFX package, and I can just say we had MFX. Note that I have to load the package before. We had MFX logit equals logit MFX. And I'm entering the same as before. Note that here, since we are saying, we are specifying that it is already a logit model, I do not have to add this additional link here. I can execute. And now, and this is important, in order to see the coefficients, we have to type in b hat mfx logit. And you have to actually use the fit, dollar sign fit. And not surprisingly, you get the exact same coefficient estimates than before. Okay. Now note that at this point we cannot interpret the 0 0.11709 as the income of the income coefficient. All we can say is that the coefficient is positive, with, which means that there is going to be a positive relationship between the independent variable income and the probability of somebody purchasing organic food. Meaning that if income goes up, so does the probability of purchasing organic food. Now, the advantage of using the logit MFX is that it gives us something called marginal effects. To find out the marginal effects, we have to type in b hat MFX logit dollar sign MFX est. Now here you get the marginal effects. Now the marginal effects, you can now interpret them as the increase in probability from an additional increase in income. In this case here, it means that if income increases by one, or if income increases by a thousand dollars, because remember organic, the income is measured in thousand dollars, then the probability of purchasing organic food increases by 2.9%. Okay, so again, an increase in income by a thousand dollars increases the probability of purchasing organic food by 2.9%. Now, it is extremely important to realize that this marginal effect of 2.9% is taken at the average income. 
Now, what do I mean by this? Let us get back to this graph here. Okay, and let me do a new graph. where we have income and the purchasing of organic food. So we have uh, buying and we have income. And we said before that we have a bunch of observations that are down here, and we have a bunch of observations that are up here. Where we have zero here and we have one here. Okay. Now let me draw the S-shaped curve. Sorry. Let me try this again. Now, I say that the marginal effects are taken, are estimated at the average income. So assume that the average income is right here. And remember that we are estimating this as, we are interpreting this as a probability. in the sense that if income increases, so does the probability of purchasing organic food. But note that since this function is S-shaped, the slope, okay, which is, represents the marginal effect, is different depending of, of the income level. So here, for example, the slope is very steep. Okay, so here, if we are increasing income, the probability of purchasing organic food goes up very quickly. But if you're thinking, for example, at a very high income levels, okay, where people are already very likely to purchase organic food, then here the slope is going to be very flat. Okay? And the same is true for very low income levels, where the slope is also flat. Okay? And then here again, we see that the slope or the steepness is different here, then here, then here. By default, if you're calculating the marginal effects in R with the package MFX, the marginal effects are taken at the average income. So if we have income here, and if this is the average, then this is where the marginal effect is taken or calculated at. Now, there is a reason why I have used the command GLM to calculate this model, this organic food choice model. Okay. Imagine you want to know what is the probability of three people with different income levels. Okay. Then you can create a new data block, and this data block has to look like the like the original data block where we have income as the independent variable, and we can say income equals say 25, 50, and 75. Now we have created a new data block with three people and those three people have an income of 25, 50, and 75,000. Now we can use the command predict, and we enter the model, the GLM model. We say comma, the new data is equal to the data block, that we just created. And what we want are the responses. Okay. Now we get 
now we get three values. Okay. Note that the first value is 5% of, of 4.98%, the second value is 49.47%, and the last value is 94.8%. Now what this means is the following. A person with an income of $25,000 has a 4.98% chance of purchasing organic. A person with an income of $50,000 has a 49.47% of purchasing organic. And a person with an income of $75,000 has a 94.8% chance of purchasing organic. Now think about this in a much broader context. Think about when you're watching something on Netflix, when you are watching something on Amazon Video, or when you're purchasing something online. Suggestions are made to you of what you may like. For example, movies are suggested to you on Netflix, or new products are suggested to you on Amazon. Now, those suggestions are net not taken out of a hat or not randomized. But think about that those firms have information about you, in terms of what you like and what you don't like. And then based on those independent variables, they run a model and predict the probability that you like one of their suggestions. Okay, So think about this a little bit broader than just with the two variable model here, where we are just looking at purchasing organic and purchasing um, and uh, based on income. Okay, you can also think about this in terms of voting. Okay, so whether you are voting a Republican or Democrat, then there are models that have data about you, where you live, for example, and they could then think about what is the probability for you to vote either way. So the application of those models is very broad. So going back to the slides. We see that here with the package MFX, you can actually estimate the marginal effects. Okay. And again, note that the marginal effects are estimated at the mean of the independent variables. You can also calculate the predicted probabilities when you're thinking about you're interested in how new customers or what the likelihood of customers is to purchase organic, then the model can actually help you predict the probability. Okay. Now here you can see again based on the function uh, based on the organic data set, you have income on the horizontal axis and you have buying on the vertical axis, and then it is this S-shaped curve which we have just estimated. Okay. Now the straight line is what is called a linear probability model. This is when you are using a regular OLS model in estimating a binary choice model. Note that this is not something you should be doing. Now, here again, we have the output. And note that for the probit model, we have different coefficients, but the statistical significance is the same. Okay? You cannot compare the coefficients from the probit model with the coefficients from the logit model, okay? which is very important. However, if you run probit model instead of a logit model. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do next. Let's just call it uh, probit. And we call it probit MFX. Then what you will see is that the Coefficients may be different, but the marginal effects are identical, or almost identical. So the probit says that if you increase income by $1,000, there's a 2.77% chance increase in the chance of purchasing organic. And in the logit model, we had a 2.9% chance. Okay, so extremely close. Okay. Hence, it, is, it doesn't really matter what model you use in practice. Okay? They give you very similar results. 
Now, let us expand this model and make it a little bit more interesting in the sense that we are going to look at general social survey data from 2018 and we are interested whether a respondent works full-time or not. And we code this as zero or one. Note that full-time is coded one and everything else is coded zero, even if it's part-time. We have data on whether the person works for the government. We have data about the education of the person, where zero, one, two, three, and four indicate an increasing level of education. We also, we also have data about whether they voted in the 2016 election. And we also have data about uh, married age, the number of kids, and their income. So let us go back to R. And we already have the GSS data loaded in here. Now in the first step, what we are going to do is that in the data, we have certain rows that have missing values. Now in order to eliminate those rows, we are typing in gss equals na.omit gss. So from 773 observations, we are now going down to 772 observations. Okay. This is simply to make sure that we do not run into any problems with missing data. Also note that we are predefining the equation that we would like to estimate. And we are just calling it full time, tilde, age, plus children, plus government, plus education, plus marriage. This avoids us typing in the equation all the time. So first we are going to use the, we are going to calculate the GLM model. So we type in B hat GLM logit equals GLM equation, comma data equals GSS, comma family equals binomial link. And let us also type in the equation for the MFX model, where we say B hat MFX logit is equal to logit MFX equation comma data equals gss so we execute this and of course it is called full time and not full time and so we can say summary b hat GLM, and we can see that whether the person works full time is dependent on age, education, and whether they are married. Whether they have children and work for the government does not have an influence or is not statistically significant in increasing the probability of working full time. Now, note that we can also predict the results now with the function predict. And let's call this GSS dollar sign fitted equals predict. And we enter the model B hat GLM logit. And now note that before we entered a new data, if we leave this empty, the model is simply going to use the old data to predict the probabilities. So we simply type in type equals response. Now what the model did, 
the following. So here, in the first column, we have whether the person worked full-time. Then we have the independent variables, which was government, married, education, age, and children. And in the last column, we have fitted. Now, the fitted is based on our model and based on the independent variables of the first respondent. There is a 74% chance that that person is working full time. Now, note that we have a 74.57% chance and that the person does work indeed full time. Whereas we have a person where our model predicts that there's only a 60.66% chance that the person works full time. And in reality, the person does not work full time. Okay. Note that we have estimated the MFX model to actually say something about the marginal effects. So we can have B hat underscore MFX, MFX S. And we get the marginal effects. And we can see that with each additional year, the probability of decrease, the probability of working full time decreases. Okay. So if you are also if you are looking at education and merit, we see that with each additional year of education the probability of working full-time increases by 3.7%. Okay, So this is how you interpret the marginal effects coefficients from this model. Okay. So this concludes of how you would estimate a binary choice model when the dependent variable is coded as 0 and 1. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. So this is the first video uh, that I will be posting over the next couple of weeks. Uh, what I want to do today is uh, finish the example that I started in class. And uh, you should have all downloaded the data set called gss.csv. And basically what it is, I downloaded data from the General Social Survey and I just isolated the data for 2018. And the variables that you're going to see in this data set is uh, full-time. That's basically whether a respondent worked full-time. Um, you have information about whether the government, uh, whether the person, whether the respondent was a government worker. You have information about the education and also if they voted in uh, the 2016 election. You have um, the variables also married, age, uh, child, which is basically the number of uh, children and also the income. And so what we are going to do is we have the data and we are going to see if uh, we can identify which variables determine if the person worked uh, full time or not. So you have the data set loaded in your uh, in R and R, R studio. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a new function that basically eliminates all the <clears throat> content, all the uh, information in the data set GSS that says uh, not a number N or NA. And the command for that is you write GSS equals NA dot omit GSS. Now, the second thing we are going to do is we are actually going to define the equation that we are going to use to estimate the model right up front because we are going to use this expression multiple times and I think it's going to be much easier if we define the equation once and then just work with the uh, work with it uh, later on. So we write equation equals full time tilde age plus child plus government plus education plus married.
So now we have, you can see here on the right hand side that we have the equation that we are going to use uh, later on. What we are going to do, we are going to estimate the logit model first using the GLM. We have seen this in class today. And then we are also going to use the package MFX. So let's just write B hat GLM equals GLM equation. Now here the equation refers to this object here. And the family is equal to binomial link logit and the data is GSS. And let's just write the MFX equation as well, which is similar, where you write a logit, FM, M, logit MFX equation, data equals GSS. We execute both lines. Now we have the objects on the right-hand side here. And the first thing we are going to do is we are going to summarize the B hat GLM to obtain the results. And here you can see now that to determine whether a person voted full time, that age, whether they work for the government, and their level of education is a determinant in whether the person works full-time or not. Now, if we say summary B hat MFX dollar sign fit, then of course we are going to get the exactly the same results. However, what is going to be interesting is if we are going to add a new column to the existing data set and that column is called predicted underscore FT where the FT, the underscore FT stands for full time and I say predict B hat GLM because remember in order to use the prediction or to make a prediction about the um, whether people are going to work we have to use the output from the GLM model. And we're simply going to say type equals response. Note that in the class I have entered I have entered a new data set in here with the income level of 25, 50, and 75 for the people purchasing organic. If I leave this empty, empty, what R is going to do it is taking the original data set and it is predicting for each respondent what the probability is of uh, working full time. So when I open a new data set, what you see is that you have in the column full time, you have the actual responses from the data set uh, GSS. And on the right hand side, you have this the predicted value. So you can see that for respondent number one, who actually works full time, the model predicts that that person, the probability of that person working full time is 86%. Okay. Now, when you're going to look at, when you're going to sort this in order, you see that the model is off in certain, uh, for certain observations. Okay. However, in Overall, the mean between, between the predicted values and the actual values is going to be the same. So if you type in mean GSS full time, you see that people working full time is uh, almost 82%. And if you say the mean of GSS predicted, that that is also 82%. So the predictions between the two models actually matches. You estimated the B hat MFX in order to get the marginal effects. 
So if you type in B hat MFX, MFX estimated, then you get the marginal effects here. So how you interpret them is as follows. And note that all those values here are taken at the mean. So for example, if somebody works for the government, there is a 7.3% or if somebody works for the government that increases the probability of working full time 7.3%. If somebody has a higher level of education, that increases the probability of being full time worker by 2.7%. Note, you may ask, well, if somebody works for the government, then it is clear that that person is working, working full time. It turns out that how I coded the data, so the, data, the original data from the General Social Survey specifies working full time, working part time, hourly worker, and so on. So here we are talking about full time workers. This means that the government, that if you work for the government, you have a higher probability of working full-time uh, as opposed to working, uh, working part-time.